Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here, for spending a lovely Saturday with us. Um, thank you to the ONSF, to Greenwich Hospital for making this day possible. Um, my name is Jordan Pasternak. I'm one of the foot and ankle surgeons at ONS. Um, this morning, we're going to be talking about um, advancements in ankle replacement, something that um, is not as mainstream as some of the other joints that we've been replacing. Um, I do not have any disclosures. Um, this is the ankle joint. I just throw this up to show that it's a complex joint. There's multiple uh, bones, there's multiple ligaments that provide stabilization to the ankle. Um, there are multiple things that we need to consider when uh, replacing or doing surgery on the ankle. So uh, what is a total ankle replacement? Um, a total ankle replacement is similar to a knee or a hip replacement, which I'm sure everyone in the room has heard of. Um, you have metal components that replace the ends of both the tibia, which is the shin bone, um, and the talus um, down here, uh, which creates the main part of the ankle joint. Um, you then have a polyethylene piece, which is basically plastic, um, a piece of uh, articulating plastic between these two segments um, of metal that allow the ankle to move after surgery. Um, who gets a total ankle replacement? Um, well, patients that have arthritis of the ankle. Um, the ankle is very different than the hip or the knee, and the reason that you've probably not heard nearly as much about ankle replacement as you have heard about hip or knee replacement is that ankle arthritis is not usually wear or tear. It's not nearly as common as arthritis of the hip or the knee. It's usually post-traumatic. Patients who have had ankle fractures, um, multiple severe sprains, things like that. These are the patients um, that get ankle arthritis that are then considered for a procedure like this, an ankle replacement. Um, patients that have ankle motion, right? And so the idea here, and we're going to talk about sort of the alternatives to ankle replacement soon, the idea is that this procedure allows an effective treatment for ankle arthritis while preserving motion. Um, what the procedure will not do is give you motion. It will not increase your motion. And so if you have arthritis advanced to the point where you don't really have motion left, um, this would not be a good procedure for you because you will not be gaining motion. Uh, but it does preserve what motion you have. Um, it's, it's a useful and good procedure in patients who do not have strong demands of their ankle. Um, patients who are not elite athletes who need to run um, and cut and jump. Um, patients who are not beating up their ankle. Patients um, who do manual labor, labor jobs, things like that. Um, because there are lifelong restrictions in place following an ankle replacement. And we're going to talk about why that is in a little bit. Um, you should not do an ankle replacement or consider having an ankle replacement. Um, if you have infection, if you have uh, neuropathy, if you have vascular disease, um, if there is inadequate or compromised soft tissues around the ankle to close over the implants, um, or if there are issues with, with your bone stock in this region. Um, so this is just an example of an x-ray. On the left side, top and bottom, um, you have a normal ankle x-ray. That is what a normal ankle looks like. On the right side, top and bottom, you have ankle osteoarthritis. So you can see this is quite a severe case, but you have complete obliteration um, of the joint space. So um, what, what, what were you doing sort of before ankle replacement came onto the scene? We were doing ankle fusions. Um, this was the gold standard um, before an ankle replacement. It is still a routine surgery that's performed today. It's still very common. Um, the idea here with an ankle fusion uh, would be to eliminate the ankle joint. Um, you would eliminate pain in so doing. You would essentially scrape away whatever cartilage was still remaining, push the two pieces of bone together and hold them there with hardware um, and have your body sort of fuse across them. Now again, the goal here for this surgery would be to eliminate pain, but you're also clearly eliminating motion. There will be no motion of the ankle joint itself following the surgery. Um, Again, this would be a better procedure or a better option in someone who has very high demands of their ankle. Um, farmers, construction workers, um, elite athletes, things like that. Um, and this is an example of what uh, ankle fusions can look like on an x-ray. Again, you are sort of smashing the two bones together and holding them there with hardware in the hopes that they fuse across. So this is inherently, the ankle has a number of challenges um, in trying to do a joint replacement. Um, the load-bearing area of the ankle, meaning basically just the cross-sectional size when you walk and, and run and do activities of the ankle, is substantially less than the hip or the knee. Um, so it's much smaller, but it sees much larger forces than a hip or a knee. Um, depending on what you're doing, the force that goes across your ankle can be anywhere between one and a half to seven times your body weight. So in a tremendous amount of force placed across a very small area, um, it's sort of just a physics problem, right? Um, you have increased potential for loosening and hardware failure. And adding to that, the ankle is a complex joint. Most of us think our ankle sort of just goes up and down. Um, it doesn't, though. It also rotates and has some translational motion as well. Um, these motions are more subtle, of course, uh, but they do exist, and they do allow the ankle um, to provide the function that it does for us in all of the activities that we all do. 
Um, so the first generation of total ankles came about uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, these were highly constrained devices, meaning they didn't really allow so much motion um, within the device itself, um, relative motion between the two components. They consisted of only two components, just the metal components, not that plastic piece um, that I had discussed and shown earlier. Um, and they were used with cement to secure the hardware into your bones. Um, they had a lot of issues with loosening. The implants would become loose. Because they were so constrained, because they did not allow for motion, um, they would sort of fail because they wanted to move a little bit, but they couldn't um, with activities and ambulation and things like that. Um, and so there was a lot of issues with early failure of these implants. Um, this is an example of what these implants would look like, um, both sort of in real life and then on an x-ray. Um, then we go to our second generation. Now we're talking like 80s, 90s. Um, now we have the three component system. We have the two pieces of metal. We have the plastic in between them. Um, there were sort of two ways to incorporate this plastic. Either the plastic would be attached to one of the metal pieces, that's called fixed bearing, or it would be sort of free floating. And, I, and when I say free floating, I don't mean completely just floating around, but it would allow for a lot of motion um, of the plastic piece uh, throughout the course of motion of the ankle. This was called mobile bearing. Um, there was a sort of focus here, a shift towards trying to remove less bone than the first generation. Um, and we sort of abandoned cement at this point. Um, we allowed more for bony ingrowth, meaning we want the patient's own bone to grow into these implants to secure them rather than relying on cement. Um, and it was thought that this would help uh, some of those loosening issues and failure, um, and, it and it did. It certainly did. Um, and this is an example of, again, what these implants would look like, both uh, in life and on an x-ray. Um, next, we're going to move on to the third generation. This is sort of 2000s, even to a, a little bit of, of current use today. There are certainly implants in use that are third generation today that are doing quite well. Um, this ended, added an independent plastic, sort of like mobile bearing meniscus, sort of like that plastic piece, just even more mobile now. Even less bone resection, right? The idea being if you can preserve as much of the patient's bone as possible um, when doing the surgery, they would benefit, right? Why take more bone than we need? Um, and we also tr sort of shifted a focus to uh, naturally balancing these uh, replacements using the patient's ligaments. This is very common when you hear uh, maybe joint replacement surgeons talking about knee balancing. It's sort of the same concept. Um, and this is, again, an example um, of what this would look like in life and on x-rays. Um, you can see, and maybe coincidentally, but each, each iteration kind of looks more higher tech. Um, that may be some sort of uh, designer's prowess there. Um, and then the last generation, the fourth generation, um, this is sort of current and still emerging. Um, this is the newest technology. These implants are, are allow for the, the smallest bone resection we've had yet, right? Taking away as little bone as we can get away with. Um, and they really, these implants really try to mimic both the patient's anatomy, the anatomy of the ankle, as well as the natural kinematics, the motion of the ankle. Um, many of these, almost all of them nowadays, have the option for PSI, which was discussed a little bit earlier this morning, um, but that's patient-specific instrumentation, um, and I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, basically, you would do a preoperative CAT scan of the patient's ankle. Now you have a 3D model of exactly what their ankle looks like, exactly where the bones are, where there might be little osteophytes, where the joint is narrowed, where there might be deformity. You have it all. It's sort of a roadmap. Basically, after you have this roadmap, engineers consult with the surgeon and the company whose implants you're using to design the exact orientation, size, and location of where the component should be for this specific patient with their specific anatomy. Um, you then have cu custom 3D printed jigs that are designed specifically for this patient that are 3D printed that would go on, used in surgery to help guide the saw cuts of bone. So again, to minimize the amount of bone you're taking and to precisely remove where uh, it's needed to accommodate the implant given the patient's bony anatomy. Um, so this is really cool. This is, this is um, very exciting technology. This is an example of what these 3D custom printed jigs look like. They are able to be, I think we talked about this a little earlier, they are able to be sterilized. They are used not only in the operating room, they're used in the patient. This is what is used to guide the cuts of bone. They're sort of pinned in place. Um, additionally, once you've done the, C the CT scan and you've finished your planning with the company's engineers, um, you get this whole printout. It's like a booklet of exactly the different locations of where each guide will go specifically for the patient's anatomy. This is just an example of how that would look. Um, on the left, you see what the pre-op sort of deformity and arthritis is. You'll see the jig uh, in the middle on the left um, placed in the appropriate position um, with corrected uh, deformity. Um, and then you'll see what the implant should look like following implantation of your final implant. So this is very, very exciting 
uh, sort of emerging technology that helps us get better patient outcomes. Um, surgically, technique-wise, um, most total ankle replacements nowadays are pr performed from what's called the anterior approach, basically just means the front of the ankle. Um, you essentially get carefully move all of the soft tissues, nerves, uh, vessels out of the way to get down to the ankle joint itself. You cut the ends of the tibia and the talus using either uh, balancing guides or the patient-specific guides we just talked about. Um, again, c achieving appropriate um, bone resection in all three planes to accommodate the implants and account for any deformity that may be present beforehand. Um, and then you put the implants in and you balance the soft tissues as needed. You would put your trial implants in. These are uh, implants not designed for implementation, but they're um, the same sort of size and location that your real ones would be to make sure you're happy with it. You may adjust tensioning or soft tissues as needed. You push, put the real implants in and then close everything up. And so these are just images of what um, a final uh, total ankle replacement would look like before you close everything up. Here are just some select x-ray views while you're uh, doing the surgery of different steps. So here's um, sort of planning for your resection of bone. Um, here the bone has been resected and these are uh, getting on the left, getting the bone ready for implants and then placing the trial implants on the right. And then the final product, um, x-ray. So recovery. So most, again, we talked about this, most of the implants currently require bony ingrowth. And so what that means is uh, the patient's bone has to grow into the implants themselves. Um, what that means is, unlike a knee or a hip, the patients are not allowed to weight bear for four to six weeks following surgery. Um, again, different from a knee or hip patients that may not be familiar with this or sort of surprised in the office when I tell them about this. Um, following that, you're usually still protecting it with another month of walking around in a boot. Um, so usually I tell patients the total recovery for this is about three months. That's what you should be thinking, three months um, for an ankle replacement. Um, to be clear, this would be sort of the same kind of path for a fusion. Um, again, that's really owing to that sort of physics problem we have uh, with the ankle, right? Tons of force um, over a small area. Um, and again, because of that problem, high impact activities are permanently restricted following an ankle replacement. Um, this is basically a study just talking about trends in total ankle replacement. Um, this looked at 2017, uh, excuse me, 2007 to 2013. Um, and basically this is a graph. The bottom line is ankle replacements. The top line is ankle fusions, just eliminating the joint, right? That was the previous gold standard. Um, and you can see the lines are converging. Um, and this ended at 2013. Um, and around 2021, the lines crossed over and are now diverging, right? There are substantially more ankle replacements being performed in the country than ankle fusions. Um, this is just the results of total ankle arthroplasty, right, ankle replacement. Um, an analysis of 25 studies showed equal pain relief uh, when compared with fusion, the other alternative. Um, at 8 to 12 years, you had an 80 to 95 percent uh, retention of the metal implants for the total ankle. Um, and it, the authors concluded that a return to light recreational activities, again, nothing high impact, we're not talking about like sprinting or tennis, but light recreational activities is completely reasonable following an ankle replacement. Um, this is another study This looked at, again, comparing ankle replacement, which is TAA, total ankle arthroplasty, versus AA, which essentially means ankle fusion. Um, they looked at the patients before surgery, six months after surgery, and then 12 months after surgery. They looked at how they did on stairs, an inclined ramp, um, and uneven surfaces, which uneven surfaces provide some challenges for patients who have ankle injuries, right? If you ever sprained your ankle, you probably know that. Um, so before surgery, there were no difference between these two groups which is good, that means we're sort of comparing apples to apples. Both, both groups sort of independent of one another did better after surgery. So regardless of which surgery you had, you did better than beforehand, right? Um, the patients who had the ankle replacement did significantly better walking upstairs, walking downstairs, walking uphill. Um, they also, of course, as you would expect, had increased motion, because that's sort of the point of this procedure, right? To preserve whatever motion you have left compared to a fusion. Um, this is just another study that looked at uh, the differences. Remember we talked about that plastic piece. The plastic piece can either be fixed to one of the metal pieces or it can be kind of moving around a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. So this compared mobile bearing where it's moving around uh, to fixed bearing. Um, and basically we looked at sort of the same thing. We looked at PROs, which are patient reported outcomes. How do the patients say they're doing? Um, examination and x-rays, again, same thing. Preoperatively, six months after, 12 months after, and then yearly. Um, everyone improved. 
right? Whether you had a moving metal, or excuse me, a moving plastic piece or a fixed plastic piece, um, there were no differences in what the patient said they were doing. There were differences in the x-rays, right? The mobile bearing implants, the ones that were moving, had a higher percentage of cis um, component malalignment and HO, heterotopic ossification, that just means extra bone. All those things are not things you really want to see in an x-ray. Um, so the mobile bearing had some stuff we don't really want to see. However, that was just on x-ray. If you ask the patients how they did, they said they did the same in both groups. So the disclaimer of this is that a clinical outcome, how you're actually doing, doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily reflected by the x-ray findings. But the x-ray findings were better for the fixed bearing. Um, and this is just what I described. Um, and then <clears throat> lastly, this is just a, a study about patient-specific instrumentation, what we talked about, those custom 3D printed jigs that help sort of make our saw cuts for specific uh, positioning of implants. Um, this was a multi-center study. 80% um, of patients had an implant placed within three degrees of the plan, those guides that I showed you that we get. Um, three degrees is a tremendously small margin. Um, you cannot usually visualize three degrees um, in the operating room. Um, up to about 90% within four degrees. Again, tremendous, tremendous, uh, tremendously small um, intervals here. Um, and all of them were within five degrees. So this is actually quite impressive. Um, the sizes were also predicted. Tibial sizes, almost all of them were correctly predicted by that CAT scan. And about four out of five were predicted right uh, on the other side, the Taylor component. So PSI really has some good potential um, for some good implant placement here. Thank you all very much for your time. Appreciate it.